JB, so, uh, I want to I want to mention a couple things here that I think are important for your audience. Um, the Venezuelan government has most of this under control right now. They've arrested 749 people already. The defense minister, which is the leader of the Venezuelan army, essentially has uh, said that they reaffirm their loyalty and unconditional support to Nicolas Maduro and that they are not going to allow this coup to continue. This is important because when we look at what happened, for example, in Bolivia, we didn't have when Evo Morales was ousted in 2019, there wasn't a leadership to follow and there wasn't an, an organization in place to prevent this coup d'etat from happening. When you have the army on your side, it is much more difficult for this to happen. When we saw, for example, the ousting of uh, Salvador Allende in Chile, right, yeah. when he was pushed out, that that was also done with the help of the military. He wasn't, he didn't have that protection. The military of a country, especially an anti-imperialist sector, a front that's so important for the anti-imperialist movement, in Latin America, you need to have a army that is loyal to you because otherwise that is how they literally coup you. And so this is very important that the defense minister has come out in support of Maduro. Right now, so good to see you, Fiorella. Thanks for having me on, JB. Nice to see you. Yeah, definitely. So as far as the election results of Nicolas Maduro in, uh, in Venezuela, um, there seems to be some hurt feelings, especially from the likes of Elon Musk on Twitter. Can we expound on why he's so hurt? Well, Elon Musk has taken it upon himself to build this reputation of being a free speech warrior, of, be, of being this advocate against the quote unquote deep state and going after the global elites. All of these words have become extremely popular, not just on the right, but all over some of the left that have traded the word capitalism for globalism. Um, OK, fine. But OK, so they so they have been going after the globalists. What's interesting is when it comes to Israel, Elon Musk sides with Bibi Netanyahu, went to visit him and receive him and giving him a warm, fuzzy welcome in Congress, along with all of our Congress that was clapping like seals and welcoming this war criminal, one of the yeah. worst, if not the worst in the last 50 years that we've had in our lifetime. And they all just are pushing this very Zionist narrative. And when it comes to Elon Musk, he's a business guy, first and foremost, he's going to go after his base, he's going to stir things up, he's going to cause chaos. If we recall back during the Bolivian coup in 2019, he did the same thing. He was allegedly joking when he said, we'll coup, we'll coup who we want to coup. But the reality is that uh, Bolivia has the largest lithium deposits in, in Latin America, among the largest at the very least, and Venezuela has the largest oil refineries uh, reserves in Latin America, as well as gold. So when we look at somebody like Elon Musk, who needs uh, his, his uh, high tech and this sort of technological sector is in need of these resources and these minerals, he's definitely going to side with the side that is the most powerful side to take over these natural resources. His family background points to that. He's a DARPA guy. He's not somebody that is any in any way, shape, or form the anti-establishment. He has ties to not just US intelligence, but also to Israeli intelligence as well. So it's no surprise to me that Elon Musk went and sided against Maduro because that is who represents him um, in terms of the opposition, in terms of this idea of putting in another Malay in Latin America. And he loves Javier Malay. Who, which who has who has taken Argentina into a complete just standstill where people are in very very awful conditions and mm -hmm. of course that is it's I wouldn't even say it's libertarianism it is absolute like it, it just completely falling apart uh, into fascism what we're seeing under Javier Malay and Javier Malay is Elon's buddy and he also claimed that the opposition won without the, the Venezuelan government even saying any election results to begin with. So what we're seeing here is this sort of very worrying technocratic push and dominion of the narrative 
by Elon Musk and his attack dogs, the and wokeness account, a lot of the big accounts, Elon Musk, Sean, all of these people that have been just pushing fake videos, not uh, videos that are from 2017 or videos that have been manipulated in one way or another in order to push this narrative of a coup d'etat in terms in favor of the opposition that the opposition won and that Maduro is going to be ousted. They're trying to push a color revolution to once again attempt to remove Maduro from power. Well, okay, so if you can, for my audience, explain what a color revolution is, because I want people to really understand that that terminology. Some people may, may not be as uh, adept as of geopolitics as you are. What is a color revolution? So a color revolution is essentially not a real revolution. We, when we talk about revolutions, we talk about planned and spontaneous. A spontaneous revolution doesn't mean that there's absolutely no planning involved, but it means that it's coming from the people. It's coming from the needs, the material desires of the people responding to a situation. You look at, for example, the Bolshevik revolution and you see, okay, that was a revolution. Yes, there was organization, but it was it came from the people there wasn't a, a funder coming in and saying hey we're going to give you a bunch of money and you're we're going to pay you and you're going to do this that's a color revolution the united states is notorious for funding these color revolutions we have seen john bolton on the cnn interview talk and gloat about how the united states has done this many times and he even mentioned venezuela so this color revolution goes as such. I am a person with money, whether a, a government entity, a CIA cutout, NED, a s sort of entity, right, NATO. I'm Victoria Newland. I come in and I bring cookies to an election and I also bring money. Bags of money, money is given to these people in, for example, Ukraine and the Donbass. This money is given to them and they in turn go and say that the government no longer represents them and they want to separate or they want to get rid of said uh, leader. So that's essentially what happened in Ukraine. That's essentially what they want to happen in Venezuela. It's what we've also seen attempted in, um, in Taiwan by funding these groups to try to get rid of the, of the, of the pro-China uh, entities and to also become an independent country away from China. So it, it, what it is in Venezuela, what we're seeing it be manifested of is these groups of people who are very poor or who have a need, many of them, the, the Venezuelan government, the Maduro administration found to have drug problems have been given $150 per day and they are being paid to basically sow chaos, start things in the street, and bring back the guarimbas. The guarimbas in Venezuela were the opposition protests that were basically violent attacks on the streets where people were killed, maimed, injured, where there was violence, burning buildings. They were um, burning the statue of, uh, of Hugo Chavez back in, in 2017 and around those times. So they're trying to bring back these guarimbas that were very deadly and awful for the population of Venezuela. And they're trying to cause chaos and sort of incite the, 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 the Chavistas and everybody else into a fight. So then you get all of these people online saying, look, the, these people aren't happy with Maduro. They want to remove him. Look at these conditions are so terrible in Venezuela. The United States needs to send help. The United States would come in send the military and of course there would be a coup maduro would be pushed out we saw this with manel zelaya in um honduras in 2009 under the uh foreign policy of hillary clinton and they basically ousted the guy in his pajamas in the middle of the night and then they removed him from power and a narco dictatorship basically took over honduras and they weren't free of that till recently so you have essentially that desire for Venezuela as well. It also happened in 2002 under then President Hugo Chavez. They tried to get rid of him as well. And in 48 hours, though, the Chavez administration crushed that rebellion and they were able to quell that and he was able to continue his uh, administration and the af afterwards up until 2012 
before he uh, died. Oh, wow. Okay. And thank you very much for that, because I, I want to make sure people understand what the color revolution actually is. This is out of RT. It says Maduro wins third term. It says the Venezuelan president has been reelected with 51.2% of the vote. Nicolas Maduro has won Venezuela's presidential election, according to official results. The leaders of Russia and China have congratulated the heads of state on securing a third term says the head of the National Electoral Council, Elvis Almoroso, announced shortly after midnight on Sunday with 80% of ballots counted, Maduro had secured more than 51% of the vote, compared to 44% for his main rival, Edmundo Gonzalez. Says, addressing supporters in Caracas, uh, Maduro has described this victory as a triumph of peace and stability. The Venezuelan opposition has fiercely disputed the result, claiming election rules were violated and Gonzalez has also claimed victory. When they said the rules were violated, what do they mean? Like, what rules? I mean, they don't have the evidence of anything being violated. They don't give it. Um, so they they don't give it because they don't have to. So what ended up happening is before the election, there was this Miami plot to basically say, for the opposition to say that, if Maduro won, that means that there was fraud. No questions asked. If Maduro won, there's fraud. And that's exactly what they did. As soon as Maduro was named the winner, they said, that's impossible. There's fraud. And so who, who runs with that narrative? The New York Times, CNN, MSNBC, all the mainstream media, the presidents, uh, the uh, Tony Blinken came out and said, we have serious concerns about Venezuela's election results. We don't feel like they reflect the will of the people. They don't have any information on the election system. They have zero information on any of that. They're saying that because they are working with the opposition to sow distrust, not just in the Venezuelan people, but in the everybody else that's not Venezuelan. So everybody can have their opinion and assume that Maduro is an evil dictator that basically has zero support and that the Venezuelan people need to be rescued, which is why you see the hashtag SOS Venezuela or hashtag oh free Venezuela, the same way you see the hashtag SOS Cuba or yeah. free Cuba. It's the same thing at play here many, many times. It's the same playbook. And so they have that, but their problem is that there was a, a report that exposed the link to this uh, Edison poll. It's an exit poll. This Edison exit poll is directly related to CIA cutouts and C uh, companies that represent the CIA narrative, like Radio Free, Radio Liberty, which is in Europe. Then they have another one in Cuba. They have several of these that are completely just full of like, you know, State Department narratives. And they're connected directly to this pollster, the Edison Research, which is in New Jersey. It has nothing to do with Venezuela. So they were using this exit poll that said that the opposition won. And because the results differ from this exit poll that has nothing to do with Venezuela, they say that Maduro definitely rigged the election because otherwise it would reflect this exit poll. So that's that's essentially what what was happening here, and, and I find it really crazy that so many people went on there and basically tried to frame it this way. And um, this this Edison Research uh, pub uh, published this exit poll on the day of the election, so everybody was able to say, "Oh, okay, well, because Edmundo Gonzalez uh, didn't get sixty five percent of the vote, that means that Maduro rigged the election." because that's the exit poll that was pushed onto the American public. So everybody was like, wow, uh, how did Maduro win by that much when we saw the poll saying that, you know, Edmundo was gonna win. And it's like, what polls were you looking at? Were you looking at the US sponsored uh, polls that have ties to the intelligence apparatus? Or were you looking to like at actual Venezuelan polls or polls that are more neutral that actually gave you a similar number? Yeah. I mean, in 2016, uh, Hillary Clinton was winning in the polls. I mean, so, I mean, it, it, of course, you know, people were like, well, these polls, we thought they were going to win. No, that's not always how it turns out. And, uh, you know, now that you mentioned uh, Anthony Blinken, as affectionately known as Butcher Blinken, 
let's take a look at what he said. You, you, you alluded to him speaking about this election. Let's take a look. Um, if uh, my colleagues will indulge me for just one minute, I want to speak quickly to the elections that just took place in Venezuela. We applaud the Venezuelan people for their participation in the July 28th presidential election. We commend their courage and commitment to democracy in the face of repression and in the face of adversity. We've seen the announcement just a short while ago by the Venezuelan Electoral Commission. We have serious concerns that the result announced does not reflect the will or the votes of the Venezuelan people. It's critical that every vote be counted fairly and transparently, that election officials immediately share information with the opposition and independent observers without delay, and that the electoral authorities publish the detailed tabulation of votes. The international community is watching this very closely and will respond accordingly. So that basically just confirms exactly what you said, that basically saying that, well, we really don't believe it. And it's like, but when a right wing coup happens, you guys are cool with it. You know, it's like they don't they don't want to fight against that. But every single time it's somebody that's to the left of a, 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 a Bernie Sanders type figure, then they want to cry. Oh, my God, this isn't this isn't correct. It just goes to show that ultimately it is really just about uh, a control of a resource rich country like Venezuela. Yeah, it's about uh, control of the resources. It's about the position of Venezuela. It is a Caribbean uh, country as well as a country in South America is at the top of South America. So it has access to the Caribbean waters and that's a very essential position to have. It also would be yet another country to be under the this neo neo colonial state of the US where you know the US still practices the Monroe doctrine when it comes to Central and South America like it's its backyard. So they have military bases in all of these countries. They lost big when it came to Colombia. Um, not obviously the president, he's not some sort of radical Gustavo Petro, but he is still somebody that has sort of tried to work with the other side of the spectrum, try to work with Venezuela, try to work with the more left leaning countries and hasn't de uh, demonized like Russia and demonized other countries like China the way the U.S the US wanted them to. So the US has lost a bit of its grip in Latin America. But unfortunately, when Javier Malay won, that was once again, attaining a portion of a very, very uh, huge part of, of the continent. And so what we're seeing here with Venezuela, and also with the attempts at trying to uh, get rid of Maduro is another form of control of the region to keep yeah. this, uh, not just the resources, but control of the entire region. Because when you think about the organizations launched by uh, Hugo Chavez during his time, ALBA, which is the organization of Latin American countries, you have CELAC as well, all of these organizations that seek to build unity within a Latin America that comes from the uh, sentiment of Simon Bolivar, who united all these countries in mm -hmm independence against the Spanish crown. So all of this goes all the way back then. And so what you have now is the attempt of the United States to take all of that back, separate these countries the same way they're trying to basically balkanize Russia. They want to like separate these countries from having their own natural resources used for their own people. And of course, continue supplying it to the West. Yeah. Basically, here is some <clears throat> video footage of the right wing protesters going against police in Venezuela. So, this is JB, so, uh, I want to I mention a couple things here that I think are important for your audience. Um, the Venezuelan government has most of this under control right now. They've arrested 749 people already. The defense minister, which is the leader of the Venezuelan army, essentially, 
has uh, said that they reaffirm their loyalty and unconditional support to Nicolas Maduro and that they are not going to allow this coup to continue. This is important because when we look at what happened, for example, in Bolivia, we didn't have when Eva Morales was ousted in 2019, there wasn't a leadership to follow and there wasn't an, an organization in place to prevent this coup d'etat from happening. When you have the army on your side, it is much more difficult for this to happen. When we saw, for example, the ousting of uh, Salvador Allende in Chile, right, yeah. when he was pushed out, that that was also done with the help of the military. He wasn't, he didn't have that protection. The military of a country, especially an anti-imperialist sector, a front that's so important for the anti-imperialist movement, in Latin America, you need to have a army that is loyal to you because otherwise that is how they literally coup you. And so this is very important that the defense minister has come out in support of Maduro. Yeah, there's actually some uh, people, some citizens also expressing their loyalty to Nicolas Maduro, <clears throat> excuse me, as well. Let's take a look at what this person says here. ¿Qué es lo que pasa cada vez que la derecha se pone violenta? Cada vez que la derecha se pone violenta, se moviliza el pueblo venezolano consciente, sabiendo que hubo un proceso electoral donde obviamente ganó el presidente Nicolás Maduro y ellos hoy pretenden llamar al caos en nuestro país. Y nosotros no se lo vamos a permitir. Fuimos, votamos y elegimos a Nicolás Maduro. Así que no se vale, Guarimba. Candelita que prenda, candelita que apagamos, aunque sea coñazo limpio. Gracias, amor. So basically, a lot of the, the citizens of Venezuela are fed up with these color revolutions and trying to overturn their elections right now. And, um, you know, I'm heartened to see that this happened, uh, especially in regards to trying to overthrow them, because really it it's really is a paternalistic type of um, a paternalistic type of response from the United States to basically tell the Venezuelan people like, this is what you need and this is what you should have. And the Venezuelan people are like, no, we have the right to say what we need and what we should have. So, yeah. Yeah, um, and I, I was just gonna say the, uh, the Venezuelan people largely, especially in the working class areas of Caracas and the working class areas of the entire country support um, Maduro because of the fact that inflation has gone down, that he has established and maintained his promises in terms of housing, in terms of providing as much as they possibly can. We do see still that wages are stagnant and this is all due to sanctions. When we talk about the immigration issue, you have a lot of people really be concerned with so many people coming in. But again, the United States continues to meddle and other countries' affairs, which causes immigration issues. They continue to want to sanction Venezuela. They're basically threatening to continue to do it unless Maduro basically gives them what they want. And that's not going to happen. So they're going to continue sanctioning Venezuela like they've continued doing so to Cuba and putting a stranglehold on their entire economy. That's essentially what caused the first massive migration after uh, 2017 when they started putting in these sanctions. It led to not just migration, crime, but death and sanctions kill. Sanctions are an act of siege war. And so um, this is what Venezuelans are, who stay there are willing to sacrifice. There's a lot of people that can't and they leave, but that doesn't mean that it's the government's fault and it's in, in its own. It's literally the sanctions that have really, yeah. really hurt the country. Well, that, that's a part of the destabilization that uh, I talk about all the time when it comes to the, the issues regarding immigration. A lot of people will say, well, oh my God, these immigrants, they're coming across our border. It is, it's an invasion that they'll say. And then it's like, okay, people do not leave a country where they have it good. It just doesn't happen. And so if they yeah. got it good in Venezuela, then they wouldn't leave. But why don't they have it good? Is it because, oh my God, the government is corrupt or is it because the sanctions that the United States and the destabilization that constantly happens in this country, from this country, from Washington, is the reason why things are so bad that they have to flee their country to come here to a country where you got half the people that don't even want them here in the first place. 
You know, it's just it's it's mind boggling. It's like if you really want people like from Venezuela to stay in Venezuela, then you make sure you stop meddling with their country so that they can stay there and actually be happy. Because a lot of them aren't happy when they get here because, well, you messed up their country. <laughs> yeah, it just makes it is it's just it's crazy. It's asinine, you know. Yeah, no, one hundred percent. And if you're not going to talk about imperialism and U.S. interventions and U.S. coups and U.S. sanctions and U.S. blockades, and you're going to talk about the immigration issue alone, then you're really just being played. Because at the end of the day, they want you angry at your neighbor, whether it's you know they're of a different party, different race, different religion, or whether they're from another country. Instead of the people making this these decisions and calling the shots. And it doesn't matter if it's a Republican or a Democrat, they're both awful when it comes to interventions. We've seen with Joe Biden, genocide Joe, what's been going on in Gaza right now, you know, Israel targeted Beirut, took out an entire building. Uh, you be, be sure that Hezbollah is going to respond. We're gonna be seeing and probably talking about this in the next few days. And then, of course, you have the ongoing uh, Russia-Ukraine, which is basically Russia versus NATO and the US. And then you have the escalations in China as well. So you have all of all of this that the United States government is fully funding and, and fully helping uh, achieve. And what are they achieving? Just more money for the defense industry, but really a lot of chaos and problems around the world that at any given moment we could see something escalate to the point of no return. And that's a very real danger we have today at this moment. Yeah. In the last couple of minutes that I have you, I just wanted to give attention to what the president of Venezuela, now reelected president of Venezuela, Nicolas Maduro, had to say regarding to these right wing uh, protests that have been escalating across the, well, that have been quelled, I should say, across the country. Estado haciendo seguimiento de todos los hechos de violencia promovidos por la derecha extremista. Le puedo decir al pueblo de Venezuela que se han hecho daño, estamos actuando y con la Unión Cívico-Militar Policial vamos una vez más, por eso yo decía, esta película la conocemos, una vez más actuando porque conocemos ese modus operandi que ha sido utilizado para el golpe de Estado abril 2002, para la primera guarimba en febrero, 27 de febrero 2004, para las acciones de violencia convocadas por Capriles un día después de las elecciones presidenciales del 14 de abril y todas esas semanas subsiguientes para la Guarimba 2014, llamada La Salida, para la Guarimba 2017. Yo lo dije en, a lo largo de esta perenigración en más de 300 ciudades. Ellos son el odio, la venganza, la violencia. Y le preguntaba yo al pueblo, noble, pueblo de Venezuela es noble, muy noble, Ustedes quieren que vuelva la guarimba y la violencia a este pueblo, a esta ciudad. Y todo el mundo gritaba, no, con mucha contundencia. Compañero Diosdado, compañero Ceballo, alto mando político presente. Pero yo veía, dado que hemos tenido siete años de paz después de derrotar con la constituyente, la perversa y dañina guarimba del 2017, 120 días de violencia, y la derrotamos en un solo día con la voluntad popular en la constituyente, yo veía incredulidad en la gente. Y se lo decía a los compañeros, el pueblo no cree que esta gente tiene un plan violento. El pueblo no cree que el plan verdadero de ellos es una llamada revolución de colores, otra vez, una conspiración y una escalada de violencia para ir a matar gente, a perseguir, quemarles las casas, quemar gente viva, golpear, porque... La gente tiende por razones naturales a borrar de la mente los malos recuerdos y nadie tampoco va a estar recordándole. Es más, cuando yo hablaba de esta parte, yo sé que era una parte ingrata, yo sé, pero estoy obligado como jefe de Estado, como líder, a hablarle al pueblo con la verdad. Sabíamos el plan antes, durante y después del 28 de julio. Hicieron todo lo posible para un escenario violento de sabotaje avanzado de servicios públicos, la luz de la gente y todo antes del 28 para que se suspendieran las elecciones. Ay. They even targeted the electricity. Mm -hmm. like, They targeted what? the National Electoral uh, Council, the, the center where all the, the voting goes and all the tallies go uh, for the, the entire country. So they targeted that as well. They burned it. They were trying to. 
Wow. And, and you know what's funny, Fiorella? I, I, I got to say this. To all the people who back the blue, to all the people who talk about, well, you just need to just follow the rules and follow the law. Well, if that's the case, then why aren't they following the rules and following the laws in Venezuela when it comes to a election that was free and fair? Because you put the word socialism in front of Venezuela and then automatically a lot of the people that were, for example, speaking out against the Ukraine war are speaking out against Palestine. Um, when you have a, a country like Venezuela that is tied to an ideology that a lot of these people in the U.S. have been brainwashed to hate, um, they they don't see logic. And in fact, the election process, the Republicans would love it if I. But they they see the word socialism and they ignored a lot of what I said. Although I did convince some people by explaining the election process and how very secure and how amazing it is. But like you know that. That is essentially what it comes down to. The same with China, right? You 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 hear this word communism or this word socialism, and people just tune it out. So that's something that we have to always fight against, and just saying, "Hey, look, like it's it doesn't matter. You're not becoming Venezuela. It's literally these people having national sovereignty. They need to figure it out. They voted for Maduro. It's up to them. The United States and or any citizen in the U.S. has zero jurisdiction." as to what happens to Venezuela. I have zero jurisdiction, you do. Like all we are there to do is to call for our country to stop interfering in it because that's what we can do as Americans. Absolutely, let's finish this up. And I would also like to get some of the process uh, from what you observed at, at Venezuela election process after this, so. Los de la gente y todo antes del 28 para que se suspendieran las elecciones. Ayer día de las elecciones atacaron ferozmente en dos puntos estratégicos del sistema eléctrico para un apagón a las 12 del mediodía y a las 8 de la noche. Y querían apagar el país y este mismo grupo conspirador. Yo estoy obligado a decirles a ustedes la verdad. Estoy obligado y todos estamos obligados a escuchar la verdad, a pertrecharnos de paciencia, de tranquilidad y de fortaleza porque esta película la conocemos y sabemos cómo enfrentar estas situaciones y cómo vencer a los so if you can give a bit of a, you know, just quick background as to how the election process is in Venezuela, I'm pretty sure it's actually a little bit more involved and detailed than here in the United States. <laughs> just a little bit, <laughs> a lot of it, to be honest. Uh, so basically they vote on Sunday, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. If you're in line, at 6 p.m. and you haven't voted, you will be allowed to vote um, even after 6 p.m., right? As long as you're in line by 6 p.m. So it's on a Sunday, so the majority of people can go and vote. It is at one place, so your precinct where you're told you're supposed to vote, it's called your precinct, that's where you go. You can't go anywhere else. There is voting in person only. There is no, no other way to vote unless you live abroad. I believe that there is a process for that, but for you go to the embassy but other than that like you have to vote in person um they have a whole like, explanation when you arrive at the precinct so you can find your table when you are registered to vote and pretty much everybody is registered to vote you go and you get your information as to where you're going your precinct and the table you belong in you have your id it has your number this is something i always say with all these Latin American countries, they require ID, but everybody has an ID. They make it very easy for everybody, even people in the favelas in Brazil, people who live in autonomous regions in Nicaragua, they all have IDs. It's it's very easy. They don't prevent people from getting IDs. They make it extremely easy. So when they call for it, you already have it. Then they also have this biometric thing where you put your thumbprint and it, it takes into account who you are. So you therefore cannot go and vote again somewhere else. You have to stamp your thumbprint as well into this uh, piece of paper. So then you sign it. And again, it's like a triple check of all of that. And then you go to your um, bowling uh, table, your mesa is what it's called. And they show you, you know, what you're going to see on the screen on this machine. 
which is an electronic machine, but it's not connected to the internet. It's not like a computer. It's not as high tech as what we see in, for example, California, or maybe parts of Florida where you're at. It's a little bit different because it's not connected to the internet. It works more like a cash register than a computer. So once you go and you choose your candidate, you will see the same thing on the screen, the candidates' faces, the parties are from, you will make your choice, you pick the, the choice you want, and you double check that choice. And then once you do that, they'll print out a piece of paper with your vote on it. You take that piece of paper and you drop it into a box. What does that do? That basically means not only is your vote registered in this little uh, voting device, that's an electronic voting device, but it's also registered on a paper trail. So at the end of the day, they have to compare that number in the voting device to the paper trail. If those two don't match, it's a no-go. That's how you avoid any sort of ballot stuffing, any sort of these things that that's called like where you hide the ballot, where you, you stuff the ballot. That's impossible because they have these numbers there all the time. Then they also conduct 54% of the machines through an audit. These machines are randomly audited. You don't know which machines they are. And they do it before, during, and after the process. And then, of course, once uh, all of that is through, once all of the people get to vote, then they start counting them in the, in the precincts, in the areas. And the people, the representatives of each candidate, of each party, are allowed to view that. The public is allowed to view this entire process. Journalists are allowed to come in. Election observers, a thousand of them, at least go and observe this entire process. And then all of these reports are then sent to the central national electoral council, the central database where everything goes. And all of that has to match the paper ballots at the end. So that's essentially how it works. It's extremely secure, extremely organized. And though we did see long lines, you saw these lines move very quickly. It took about three minutes to vote. So that's essentially how it works. I, it, it would be next to impossible to statistically rig this election because they would have had to know how many people were going to be the 45% of the machines that weren't audited, right? So it would have taken, they would have had to, the Chavistas would have had to rig it by a number of, I think, 1.4, 1.5 million votes. It, what what the opposition is claiming is just not possible to have happened with this level of scrutiny and security of the election system, let alone, obviously, the popularity of Maduro. I don't know if you saw, but he he had mil a million people or so come out from all over for his last rally. Yeah. So in other words, Maduro legitimately won his election. <laughs> and for all the people who talk about Oh my God! But he won a third term. These are the same people that get mad that that won't get mad about FDR winning four terms. Franklin Delano Roosevelt right. won four terms in the United States. Wow. So that is basically the long and short of Maduro winning. The United States is trying to undercut that. And uh, yeah, so man, I, I'm just really grateful for you reporting on this because this gives us more of an incentive to look at countries like Venezuela and say, wait, how can we actually have a better electoral system than what we do have now? How can we have it more secure than what we do now? You know, thank you for that. Yeah, yeah, we should, we should. I mean, Jimmy Carter voted uh, this election, the best in the world, the Jimmy Carter Institute. So there's something behind that. Yeah. So there's something behind that. I mean, they, they really do. Yes, they have machines, but they have a paper trail. I believe in paper trails very, very much so. And I think we don't, we don't have any of this. We don't have public counting. We don't have, you know, this way to verify people. We don't, we don't know who owns these machines. These are open source machines. So at the at the people, the public, can look into it right now. If you go to the website, uh, they will publish it for people to see all of the results. We don't get that in the U.S. at all whatsoever. So that's what the Venezuelan people get. So. Wow, man, this is so great. Where can people find you and what do you got coming up next? 
Well, so I, I do a lot of content for this new uh, project called Beyond Headlines. So I do stuff a lot of that on Twitter. You can find me at Fiorella Isabel on Mo in uh, Fiorella in Moscow on Telegram, Fiorella Isabel on Twitter. And you can also find me on Rumble. I do interviews there. I will be talking to Anya Parampal this week as well on the Venezuelan election, but as well as, of course, the the coups and the ins and outs of all of that, the intelligence apparatus behind it. So be on the lookout for that as well. And I was taken off YouTube, so I have YouTube. So, um, but yeah, you can find me on all the other ones, Rumble, Rockfin, X, Telegram, all of that. Nice. Thank you so very much for joining. And thank you so very much for educating me and the rest of my audience. It is always such a good time to see you. Thanks for having me. I'll see you next time, JB. All right. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you so very much for watching my channel. And I deeply appreciate it from the top and bottom of my heart. If you wish to support the channel further so I can keep bringing you content that is educational and informative, you can become a patron on patreon.com forward slash jbfond. You can find that link in the pinned comment or in the description below. No matter what you give, you'll be supporting independent media and education that helps make the world better. Thank you so much. And you can watch more of my content here. Forehead kisses and have a beautiful day.